Hi everybody, uh, Tom Canning here and welcome to another Berkshire Football Stories podcast, this time with an international flavour to it. I have actually written notes for this podcast, such as I am nervous about one of our guests and talking to him. He's a very nice man and he's been on lots of very big uh, and important podcasts other than this one. Um, but first, no less important, we are joined by Alicia Povey, our resident futsal expert, Um Alicia pays for Southampton Aztecs in the top tier of women's futsal in England. She's written this, so I'm reading this directly. Um, <laughs> she was formerly vice captain and all time women's top goal scorer at Reading Royals. Um, and she is an occasional commentator and studio expert on the BT Sport coverage of the National Futsal Series. She also does a lot of nutmegs and falls over, which is uh, the bit I wrote. Um, <laughs> Also joining us uh, is Paul Watson. Um, Paul is the author of the really, really excellent and the first and the reason that I he came into my sphere of knowledge, the excellent book Up Pompeii, which I'm hoping I've pronounced correctly. Um, it's the story of a man who wanted an international cap and ended up writing the heartwarming story of football in Micronesia. And Micronesia is exactly why we're here today, because um, Paul, you are organising. Oh, sorry, I should say hello. I haven't said hello. Hello, oh, everybody. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello. Um, uh, so, so everybody's here. We uh, and we're here because we want to talk about futsal. Uh, Paul, you. Uh, we'll start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this madness that you're up to in Micronesia? Yes. <laughs> so I'm. I'm trying to organise the first ever futsal competition in the Federated States of Micronesia. Um, and oh, it's kind of a long story how that has come about. But um, read the book. Buy the book. I did write a book about it. So um, <laughs> basically, in short, uh, yeah, this this kind of stupid idea that I'd had of trying to be an international footballer and refused to give in on um, led to me going over there at the age of 25 to the Federated States of Micronesia, to a tiny island called Pompeii, which is one of the four Federated States, um, and trying to coach at the time what was listed on Wikipedia as the world's worst football team um, to their first ever win. And, you know, it kind of started off as a really silly project and, you know, it's a sort of joke down the pub and then it became quite serious in terms of by the time we actually, I say we, me and my flatmate both went out together, um, by the time we left the UK, the goal was actually to effectively restart football on this island um, because football had got kind of discontinued um, uh, after they'd lost 16-1 to Guam, which is like the the big neighbours, and funding had just been cut and there was absolutely no funding for football and the team had sort of drifted apart. So the idea was actually just to sort of restart football and that's what I did for about 18 months. Um, set up a whole football programme from uh, schools and from sort of grassroots, uh, set up a league and then um, picked a, a team to go off island to try and compete in a tour of Guam. Um, and where that ended up leaving us, um, this is now 2010, was with the four Federated States of Micronesia, which are uh, Pompeii, where I was, and then Yap, Duke and Koshai, um, setting up uh, a united FA, which could be regarded as a nation by FIFA and going in search of FIFA membership, because um, they are one of only six sovereign nations in the world that are not in a FIFA confederation. And sadly, that didn't work. Ten years later, we are exactly where we are. And one of the big takeaways that, that we had, it took me far too long to come to this revelation, was that actually futsal would make a lot more sense. Um, partly because of the climate, because the pitch is flooded all the time. Uh, it, it, it's one of the rainiest places on earth, so it rains all the time. Um, and you, you can't reliably play outside. Partly because um, kids there are very well suited to it they love basketball they love uh high intensity sports where you get a lot of touches of the ball and 11 aside football is a lot more difficult to get people excited than when you could bring a ball indoors and everyone's kind of crowding around um but possibly the main reason is one of the biggest problems in the region is people can't compete there's nowhere there's no real chance for teams from those islands to go off island and compete because it's so expensive to fly so futsal obviously cuts the squad size down massively because you're only actually looking for um, at worst six people going off the island at most obviously you want a few more but um, if you have to you can cut it to six and um, that takes the cost down massively so that's where we got to this point where we're trying to set up this first ever tournament for these four islands um, all of whom have played football futsal, except for Koshrai which didn't even have a football or a futsal when they entered the competition <laughs> genuinely um, they said we want to be involved kids want to play I said, great, you know, what are you lacking? They said, well, 
a futsal and I said okay we don't have a futsal ball fine you know you can use a football for now we'll work it out I said no no we don't have that either <laughs> okay so what what do you have for this said, well a basketball okay <laughs> so <laughs> and that's where we are now is trying to get footballs uh, and futsals out there and setting up this tournament as a goal you know to give kids a reason to actually have a, a, a motivation because that's one of the biggest problems at the moment. Leach, I think, can I th- throw the floor to you as our as our futsal expert? Yeah, I mean, I just that sounds incredible. Um, I think like even in the UK, futsal's not really like a big thing. I think it's getting there, but the fact that you're taking futsal to Micronesia is just incredible. I think it'll be exciting, and I can't wait to see what happens. Really, well, have they we, got a women's we... team? Maybe that you could uh, maybe have yeah. <laughs> The interesting. So the interesting thing in Micronesia, which is, I don't know if this is, it's probably not unique, but um, uh, men and women, boys and girls, always play alongside each other. There's no, there's no distinction in Micronesian culture, and there never was in Pompeii. So it was quite funny when I went over to Pompeii. I thought, you know, I'm going to be this uh, this Western guy who's going to come in and tell them, you know, women need to play football as well, and I'm going to be this this big white saviour. No, sure enough, I turn up and women are just playing in the games and no one even noticed, you know, no one cares. It's not like a big issue. So um, some of the teams, yeah, some of the teams in the 11 side men's league technically have women in the teams. It's not called a men's league, it's just a, a league. Um, and so that really put me in my place. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We're actually the ones that are, that are making a big deal out of this. So yeah, no, there, there, there may well be women uh, playing in the futsal competition. We, we're not sure yet exactly who's going to pick who, but it's, yeah. So it, awesome. it, what's the what's the selection process like for, for, for playing? Is it is it kind of, do, do you have to have lived for a certain number of years on one of these specific islands? Um, so, and, I, and I'm harking back to I heard you on um, I think it was the Guardian Football Weekly yeah. last week about your 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 elusive search for that cap. Um, do you, do, could, could Paul be called up for? Oh, I thought have, you were angling. I thought you were angling for a cap. I thought you. Oh God, say, no, well, no, no! I can, <laughs> I can barely um, play six aside or eleven aside football with a size five football, let alone. Um... <laughs> no, um, well, it's really such a problem because. The, the there's not really going to be a problem with nas- nationality, really. The actually the interesting thing is one of the teams, um, Koshrai, doesn't have any structure on the island. But one of the reasons this whole process started was I was contacted by a Koshrayan, uh, well, a, a US kid uh, who called Kenneth, who got in touch with me and said, you know, I've just found out. I should, I think he knew, you know, I've known for years. He had Koshrayan heritage. His, his mum was from Koshrai. Um, and he was saying, look, is there a national team for me to play for? I want to play for Federated States of Magnesia. And part of the reason this whole process started was I was saying, well, look, there, there, just, there isn't, but, you know, maybe we can start setting things up again. And um, so he's going to come in from the US and he plays <laughs> at college level in the US. So he's going to probably be the, the standout player of this tournament. Wow. But um, no, I don't think we've got any problem with them. Like, Chu can't going to fly in a load of Brazilians or anything like that. I don't think it's going to be uh, quite homegrown. But yeah, a lot of stuff, you know, we are... It's as rustic as it gets. Like the yeah. goals are going to be made out of fishing nets and pipe. We looked into getting goals transported, but it's actually the shipping costs that are just right. absolutely astronomical. So it's we are starting from absolute, you know, it's, it's an entry level competition in, in a way, which is quite unique. That some of these kids will have very, you know, early stages grasp of what the what the game is, but uh, but it's not going to be a mismatch because nobody on those on those courts is going to be like a, a, an experienced like you know player of the sport and i think that's why it works whereas micronesia has sent out 11 aside teams to competitions in the region and been beaten by world record score lines and it's not a useful developmental experience to lose 30 or 40 nil it's it's really dispiriting and they don't really learn anything from that so what's nice is this tournament everyone should be reasonably equal and each game should be competitive and hopefully they're just enjoying it and in the process kind of learning about about the sport that's that's kind of where we where the, the the point of it is, isn't it? I, I suppose that they that they're enjoying a a sort of a, a slightly more organised level of, of of football, really, for for want of a better for want of a better term. And Leash, you look like you were going to say something. I was just going to ask, where are you sourcing the referees from? Uh, well, and what's the all referee the um, going to be like? <laughs> it's a good question. There, there won't be so much um, heckling of the referee as we're used to in this country. <laughs> it's going to be the. So each team has a representative. So there's a football officer now on each of the four islands. 
Uh, and they're basically the coaches as well. Um, you know, it's more or less the same role. And each of them is going to coach and referee. So, you know, when Duke play Kosh Rai, we'll have Pompey and Yaps um, representatives as the referees and they'll just rotate around like that. But luckily it will be really, you know, there'll be a lot more respectful atmosphere. It's not culturally done to, to lament referees. It's just just not in the culture at all. Um, it's a very respectful and elder-centric con- culture. So people generally don't talk down to older people, which, which I learned to my cost when I was coaching because I was much <laughs> younger than a couple of the players. And I wasn't rude to them in, in any terms, but I would yell instruction. And if I said it in the wrong way, they would just walk off and I'd have to go to their houses to apologise in front of their families. <laughs> 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 I'm not that kind of coach either. I'm not a yeller. I'm not rude. I don't swear at people. I never belittle anyone. But even within, even my very gentle insistence that someone... Mm sort of play someone offside or, you know, get back from a position they're in was too much sometimes. <laughs> um, Lish, I, I, just for, for anybody listening to this who is not massively familiar with with, with futsal, um, can you just talk us through kind of what the fundamentals are? But, uh, Paul, you may learn something here as well. I don't know. I, I really um, will. I absolutely um, will. <laughs> <laughs> what, what sort of the fundamentals? Um, what, are, what, are the, what, are the, what are the key rules and... And, and 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 various things. I always like when I do watch it. I like it when the goalkeeper comes out and goes on a run. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I mean it's quite similar to, to football, really. Um, like you could probably go onto a, a football court and and like give it a good go. Um, obviously, I don't know if uh, Paul whether this will be the case in Micronesia, but there's a stop clock. So if the ball goes out of play or um, yeah, the, the, the play stopped and the, stop, the clock stopped, so there's no time wasting, which is nice. Um, well, it can only have can be ball. nice or it can be exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but if you play, I always used to get told off by my coach, Fernando, at Reading, because I used to go and get the futsal for people, because it was when we were coming back from COVID, and I just wanted to like get the game going again, because I was sick of not playing. And he always used to say, like, why are you wasting your energy getting the ball? Like, the, the the clock has stopped. Just let them go and get it. Um, so I just get in trouble for that. But um, yeah, the keeper only have it for four seconds um, in their own half and they can only receive it once. So that kind of takes them out of the game. But like you say, Tom, if they want to go on a wa- like a wavy run. They can get forward and they can have it for an unlimited amount of time in the opposition half. Um, yeah, I honestly can't really think, <laughs> I can't think of any others. Maybe I'm just, I don't know. I maybe I'm missing things. It's maybe because I was watching Five Aside yesterday, so I've got that rule in my head. But I think did, those are the main ones. Did you come to futsal from football? Like, were you a footballer who became a futsal player? Yeah. So I hadn't played before, and then I started at uni. I think a lot of the English mm. futsal people did. Um, so I was at Bath, and they were quite good at futsal. And then did a year abroad so I studied Spanish and Russian at uni so oh, did a wow. like year abroad in Spain and Russia um wow. weirdly played beach football in Russia and then oh, only 11 aside in Spain and then yeah I just kind of like fell out of love with football um I played like an okay level and then just concentrated on futsal and here I am just playing futsal now but working for a football club so <laughs> doing it all I guess that's very cool um, wow, I bet you that's an amazing series of events in itself. Like some of those, <laughs> and like now, now when you're saying, you know, yeah, just played in Spain and Russia, and you think, wow, it just feels very, um, <laughs> yeah, very exciting and unusual thing to do. Yeah, maybe um, beach football is the next one for uh, Mike and Yeah, football. well, the funny thing is, people often say to us, beach football is a logical step, but actually, um, slightly counterintuitively, there are very few beaches, uh, not certainly not sand beaches. Mm. Um, so Pompeii is inside the reef, so there's no there's no sand beach in that way. Like you can access them on a boat, but you're not really going to do that in, in very often. Um, yeah, so actually, beach football sounds like it's it's a really good option. Um, it has its own set of rules, does it? Beach football is it? It's an entirely yeah, I mean, it's quite different... it's quite similar to futsal, really. Um, I mean, like talking about places that you wouldn't expect beach football to be played. I was playing in St. Petersburg, which is not particularly peachy as a place. And um, it was minus <laughs> 21 degrees when I started playing. But um, yeah, it's quite wow. similar. Um, <laughs> you just got to keep the ball off the floor a lot. So obviously the ball is different. That was nothing about futsal. The ball, you'll know this ball, is slightly heavier and it doesn't bounce yeah. as much. So 
it's yeah. good for like the first touch and kind of skills which I don't possess that many of but <laughs> some people do <laughs> I was going to say these sound like skills that I wish I had when I was uh, when I was playing the the, the Brighton Sunday League Division 3 was uh, was was even even that was too high for me arguably um, I was very much a close my eyes and head the ball man um, <laughs> that was a it, it, yeah, it's interesting though because I think well. So what we in the region, the Solomon Islands, have recently become really good. So you know, I mean, say it's not been sudden. You know, it's been a long process of development, and um, it's really interesting to see how that can also develop through the eleven side team. So obviously, Solomon's got a couple of players like Raphael Leai who's just come to play in Bosnia. First. Um, Solomon Island to, to come to and, it, and you know his whole development was through futsal and then he moved into football and I think sometimes you get involved in this debate with people it gets quite quite heated about whether futsal being seen as a development tool, tool for football and whether it's always seen as subsidiary in some way or like lesser in that way or whether it's seen as a completely different sport I guess people quite angrily saying to me you you seem to interchange the two football and futsal <laughs> and the reason we do that is because basically to our intents and purposes it, it is interchangeable in that we want kids kicking a football or futsal mm. just kicking something and enjoying it and playing a sport around it it's very very like simple for us it's like if we can get them playing futsal brilliant if we can get them playing football brilliant and if the kids that play futsal are likely to want to play football as well and the kids that play you know it's not they're not a competitive thing but i was interested to see whether for people really in the futsal world does it feel like this is a separate sport or is it annoying that it's sometimes seen as a development tool for football as if everyone should want to be a footballer and futsal's just a subsidiary thing i guess um I'm not going to be one of those angry people that shouts at you, Paul, for saying that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I was about to hang um, up just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's getting there in terms of like, if you look at where the league is now for, for like the National Futsal Series, it's getting there as its own kind of thing. Um, but then you look at a lot of like Premier League clubs um, and a lot of them use futsal as a tool in their academy. Um, and there's quite a few people in the futsal community who work in football academies and, and teach futsal um it is a like it is a really good tool to develop players because you have to be really quick thinking it's like that first touch is so important and then you see obviously everyone talks about like Messi Ronaldo and players like that going into football and being incredibly sort of talented obviously Max Kilman in the Premier League I'm mentioning him Tom because he's was at Maidenhead so football <laughs> yes. in Berkshire got to, get those, um, got to get those little Berkshire links in somehow <laughs> yeah, yeah and like I mean in I'd say in the women's league uh, for the National Football Series probably like 80-90% of the girls play football as well um, I don't anymore just because I don't well I do a little bit but when I'm not injured but um, I think it is kind of until football becomes like a viable option to kind of play more competitively. I think it's going to be that it, it can be used as a development tool. But yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and say that it needs to be completely separate because I think it works both ways. To be honest. Yeah, and it, 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 I mean it's interesting from our point of view. So one of the reasons we are where we are in Micronesia is because FIFA hasn't stepped in, um, and the process to get into Oceania Football Confederation or Asia Football Confederation is really unclear and lengthy and more political than, than anything else. Um, and so it's strange because to some degree you look at it and you're like, well, maybe futsal is an opportunity to circumvent that because, you know, we can demonstrate that there's development going on. You know, we are trying to develop people. We're trying to get kids playing. But actually, of course, that weirdly sort of also is under FIFA's role, right? But... Yeah, I was reading. Is there another futsal governing body as well? Because I got really confused by this. <laughs> uh, I honestly don't know. So we're in England governed by FIFA. Um, mm. So, but yeah, they're not. They, they. I'm not going to slag them off, but they haven't historically <laughs> been particularly helpful um, with futsal. Um, like they've only just. Well, they've just announced that they're going to have a women's futsal World Cup. But then you like dig down and you literally can't find any kind of date of when that's going to be. There's literally nothing concrete anywhere. Um, wow. So I think it's, yeah, it's like trying to staple jelly, trying to get information about futsal from anywhere. So I, I don't, that's I don't bad, 
kind of crazy when you think about it because that's not a small detail. You're not trying to find out like when <laughs> I don't know the the re- your regional <laughs> tournaments. Like, you're talking about the World Cup here. Like, if you can't yeah. find the dates of a World Cup, it shows there's a little lack of organisation. Yeah. I think it seems to be like that. Kind of is the way with with futsal. I think just because it's growing quite quickly, especially in England. Like with the they've just announced an under 19s men's team who were like created and went to their first qualifiers within three months. So they literally wow. met up for three months before, went to the qualifiers, qualified through their first round, which everyone was shocked about. Um, and then got that like knocked out in the second one, but they're playing like Italy and teams like that who have had a Jeez, football team yeah. for years. Um, <laughs> and now they're talking about getting a, a women's under 19s going and then senior teams as well. Um, but again, it's just sort of you don't know when they're gonna appear. When it, um, yeah, so, and what yeah, just, wasn't there? A lo- I, I heard a load of funding was cut from. So was that was that permanent or was that reinstated? It's a bit of a, I saw a lot of angry futsal people on, on my <laughs> yeah. Twitter. About a year ago. Yeah, I was probably one of those angry people. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so during COVID, they cut. All, nearly all of the funding for futsal and they disbanded the so there was a men's senior team and then there was a I think an under 19s uh, boys uh, they cut funding to both of them uh, right before a qualifying tournament which didn't go down particularly well as you can imagine um, and I d- honestly don't so there's now England Futsal which is a separate company supported by the FA Um and I'm not sure in terms of funding what that means. I think it is kind of self-funded with some support from the FA. But they're the ones that are now kind of running the national teams rather than the FA. Um, it's quite interesting because like, going back to like beach football, for example, that's, that, that's run separately outside of the FA and they operate a national team. But it's not kind of like the FA don't have any say over it. So people are kind of saying, why can't Futsal do that as well? But yeah, if they don't want to like let it go, but they don't want to. But isn't that a really know. that's a really odd situation then? Because surely it all still comes under the the FIFA umbrellas are still the same, so it still comes under UEFA, and therefore UEFA deals with the English FA. It wouldn't yeah. deal with another entity. So I find that really confusing in theory. <laughs> that the it I mean it just sounds like the FA is basically not taking responsibility for it, but on the other hand, isn't wouldn't be willing to release it completely because then you're not being the governing body for for all football and you're it seems that's it's very, very confusing. Yeah, yeah it is confusing. it is. And honestly I just I don't know if I'm gonna ever dive into the politics of of football because it is yeah, it's it seems very complicated. And everything like from a from my point of view as a player, it would be very straightforward. Just like grow a, grow the leagues, get a national team, compete internationally. I don't understand, like, if other countries can do it, why can't we? (laughs) Gibraltar have a women's futsal team. If Gibraltar have one, I think England could probably just about have one. But (laughs) there we go. Um, Do you mind if I jump in? This is is very entertaining. I'm enjoying listening and learning. Uh, I'm learning an awful lot. But um, I've got a burning desire to ask Paul about the kits because I, I think there will be a few listeners... Um, who are uh, into their kits, and these are something special. Um, so, Paul, I just wanted to to give you a moment to uh, to see if we could sell a few shirts. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Um, yeah, we so we got shirts made for the competition, and there's a company called Stings. They're quite um, they're kind of a UK based company, and I know Ernie who runs Stings. He's a really good guy. He's made shirts for teams in the Conifa space, so in the non FIFA mm-hmm. recognised space before. He made a beautiful shirt for Two Value. Uh, made one for Matabele and they're just gorgeous. So when we had this tournament, obviously none of the teams have have kits. So I went to him and said, look, do you think you could get shirts for these teams? And he's his company's things have now designed working with the Islanders four shirts, one for each team. And they are absolutely stunning there. They're incredible. When I first saw the Koshrai shirt, it was one of those moments where you look at it, you think, oh my God, it was a breathtakingly good shirt. Um, and it's got this bird on it, the Koshrai and white eye, which is unique to Koshrai. It's like got this like bird and it's red and black and it is just gorgeous. Um, I'm not even a big football shirt person, weirdly, even though I love football. I'm not <laughs> like one of those people. Um, and so these shirts, selling these shirts, 100% of the profit from that goes to the teams and it's going to fund the the flights for the players, which are not 
cheap, but, you know, they are possible. And when we first set out, the aim was to raise maybe about 30% of the tournament costs from these shirts. And this, especially this Koshrai shirt, has absolutely become sort of a, a bit of a cult phenomenon. And I think we've sold 600 shirts over the last um, 10 days. And they've all just come directly through me. So I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm sort of like, people must think I'm aware, I've got a warehouse, you know, that it has been just me sort of chugging through the orders. Um, but what it's done is it's paid about 75% of the tournament costs wow. and I paid just from shirt sales, which is an amazing thing. Because it's, it's a very hard thing for islanders to go, uh, on any of these islands, to go out and get funding is very difficult. Um, and what the, the attitude over in my community at the moment, I think is that, football and therefore futsal need to prove that they're worth before they can really generate funding and the reason for that is because past football programs have slightly inadvisedly ended in um, quite a lot of money being spent on tournament competition and coming up against the likes of Fiji and Vanuatu men's national football teams and being beaten by scorelines that are then embarrassing for the country and but sadly because of the social media age those scorelines big deal and they go around the world and these poor yeah. kids 16 year old kids are seeing facebook you know people laughing at them and um and so yeah so we have to sort of prove this sport is viable and bringing in a degree of the funding for the competition is a big part of that and so yeah these these shirts of um i did not expect people <laughs> it's, it's something really amusing about it as well there's people in brazil who are now big fans of the duke national team and there's uh, <laughs> getting people in italy saying you know, I need my Koshrai shirt. And it's yes, just really sweet. It's really lovely. You know, um, it's hard to put these places on the map at all uh, for most people. Even for me, <laughs> it's hard to find Koshrai. <laughs> um, so it's lovely to see this. And it's meaning a lot to the players out there because it shows there's a community that they're buying into. And I think futsal has been really good in that anytime I've spoken to a futsal person, uh, they've been warm and friendly and excited. And I haven't always had that through football, to be totally mm. honest. Football has been a bit tricky. And it's so lovely to have this community that maybe because it's a slightly underdog community, it's a community of a sport that is often treated as lesser or mm. treated as minority. And therefore, people really seem to rally around this idea that there are people on these small islands who have very few sporting opportunities and they really want to buy into this sport and be part of it and haven't been given any support from the governing bodies. And I think maybe futsal just even speaking about how English football is being treated, it maybe it resonates quite quite strongly <laughs> with people in the sport. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I think like just from where futsal's come from, obviously it's like uh, like historically played in like favelas and and that those sort of like areas of, of Brazil and and South America. So I think yeah, like you say, it's always it's always kind of been maybe not the kind of like bougie sport that that football is to some extent. Um, and yeah, like the football community in England is just like incredible. Everyone is super nice. So I'm not surprised that you've had that kind of that kind of like reaction pool. And I think like I was surprised the other day I was watching um the Spain Ukraine Euros final, the women's futsal. And I like went on one of the girls like Spanish national teams Twitters and she was following me and I was like Oh what? Because like <laughs> That's people very just, cool. they, they, they just seem to have like everyone. This it's just quite a big like network and yeah. I think like like you say that the like, football community are quite happy to to help each other. Whereas I think yeah, football is a bit more of a like clan kind of your you have your team and that's who you support and that's who you help. Whereas football yeah. is a bit more like the sport generally. And I, I get that experience as well with it. And it, I mean to be honest, it's a bit like that. that I'm sort of chatting to you here, and it's like. You know, I get to chat to people in futsal who whose credentials are just second to none. And you have this moment of thinking, in the football equivalent, I'm going through their agent and then I'm probably yeah. getting passed off to someone else who's dealt to deal with people like me who just give me the, the brush off because they don't they're too important <laughs> to, to give ten minutes of their time. And you know, it's it's so nice to think you can talk to people in that way. And um yeah, I think it's really exciting to be able to do that. And when I talk to the um the guys in Micronesia, um, some of them have been following the Solomon Islands and that that their progress. So, for example, the the new coach of the men's national team in Solomon Islands is, is Damon Shaw, and he's obviously he's um, I think he's English, isn't he? Is he British? Certainly. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, and so he's been lovely with his time, really supportive, happy to chat. But then I go back and tell 
the guys in Micronesia and they're kind of starstruck. They're like, wow, really? <laughs> you spoke to him? And, and, I, and I get that because for them, you know, he's a big deal. Um, but in football, the equivalent just wouldn't happen, sadly. Like, I, I don't think I could get in touch with, uh, you know, a national team coach and expect that kind of, that kind of just openness to talk, you know, to, mm. to someone who is trying to help a nation with really zero credentials at this point. And it's, it's really touching, I think. Um, Paul, I was I was going to interject, but you were you were uh, in in full flow. I, I just want to say, um, where can anybody buy these shirts? Ah, well, from me <laughs> directly. <laughs> That's the whole um, problem. So Paul, contacting um, you on I'm, Twitter at Paul underscore C underscore Watson. Yeah, get me on Twitter, and I think I've replied to everybody. Occasionally, <laughs> it seems like Twitter's. Uh, Twitter DMs is not the best way to do business. It turns no. out. <laughs> but, um, I think I've replied to everybody. I really do. And if I haven't, uh, they can usually find me anyway. Um, usually, I've put my email address on there, which I probably shouldn't do. But uh, yeah. I trust most people are <laughs> not nefariously trying to get hold of Micronesian football shirts. <laughs> <laughs> the black market for Micronesian uh, <laughs> knockoff Micronesian football shirts. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Um, I, I suppose I, I may be maybe putting something down in in print uh, for want of a better phrase. That I, I don't know if I'll be able to meet. But um, we recently um, smothered our website in adverts, which thankfully no one has highlighted yet. Um, so it, they must be okay. Um, but it's it's making some reasonable money. It's going to allow us to pay for all of our web services, and there's a, quite a little bit of money left over. So um, I'm going to say, uh, how how long are these shirts on sale for? Um, we're going to do another run and they'll be on sale for about another month. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to potentially say that we, we as FIB might try as football in Barsha might attempt to buy one of each and see if we can, we can have some sort of competition, um, oh, with, with people within, um, cause I believe they're 30 pounds, aren't they? Yeah. 30 pounds. So we tried to keep them as cheap as we could yeah. actually to make them accessible. Cause that's another thing that I spend a lot of my time um shouting about but is how expensive and unaffordable yes. football shirts and football kits and it really is pricing out most people and so yeah 30 was about as low as we could go yes. while maintaining a profit to get enough people a yeah. flight um as i say 100 percent goes to the players um no money to the manufacturer which is the amazing thing i mean yeah. obviously i wouldn't be taking any money but the, <laughs> the manufacturers themselves things have done it all at the goodness of their hearts which i think is quite exceptional too actually well we'll see where we'll see as i say this may age badly um but we'll see we'll see where we are um as, as, a, as a fellow sort of volunteer organization we'll see where we are and see uh, that that seems like a quite a nice thing that we could perhaps do and work out how we could best give them away to to someone who's who's really keen so um i, I feel like i feel like i don't know was there was there anything else we need to add have i have i missed anything obvious off good question uh, i can't think of anything massively obvious i mean the biggest thing for us actually going forwards is it's really nice to have um for some people that we can communicate with and just say you know we have some questions about x and y because i'm not this is the thing i'm i'm as inexperienced in futsal as the guys in micronesia in many ways like i've done i've actually i did a level one coaching and i had i've had you know various experience watching and playing a little bit but i'm really a novice so um, for our point of view, the more people we can have who actually do know their stuff, that we can just connect with the guys in Micronesia so that when they have a question come up, it's really useful to have people who we can ask. So if there is any chance we, we could do that, um, that would be really appreciated if that's OK. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably have quite a good grasp of people in, in England that, are, that have know, that know a lot more than me. I've only been playing for eight years. I don't think you genuinely said that in a modest way. Yes. That, was meant as, that was meant as like eight years of, of football experience, and you that know the level you like played. Long. I, I, I think it's fair to say that you are the expert that I was talking about. I wasn't sort of saying, oh, okay. "Could you?" Well, yeah, of someone? course. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you can ask me, but maybe refereeing. Like, I have a tendency to not question referees, but obviously that doesn't happen in Micronesia, so that's fine. But. um yeah, there's, a, there's a, like you say, like the first community, they're so helpful. But yeah, any kind of contact you need. And yeah, I'm here always just to chat rubbish about futsal. So yeah, anything you really need. Kind. I mean, also it's just, it's, it's really nice for them to connect with people who play at a high level too, because I think it's it's aspirational and it, um, 
it gives that sense of like there is something to to get to you know i mean maybe maybe it won't happen for for like you know most of the players to get to, to that kind of level but you you never know and it's nice for them to have a chat with someone who does play at a high level because i think it yeah it just motivates doesn't it and that's something they're really lacking there's no role models uh in football there's none in futsal like it, it's just never happened and that's definitely a factor because there's a way mm. that they look at it and say well this isn't something we're supposed to do and i think that's a big thing to overcome so it's nice for them to chat to people and see that just human beings you know foot, foot yeah. are just human beings. yeah um, and 100 percent because they're gonna end up being those those role models if they exactly. like if they're taking the kind of initiative and and getting involved they're gonna be the ones that people are looking up to and and wanting to kind of emulate so yeah I, I am oh. thoroughly up for uh, kids in Micronesia walking around in Southampton Aztec shirts with Povey on the back. I'm, I'm all for um, this. You know, uh, yeah, well, it, my, my parents have them, so <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. Remember, the, in my book, I mentioned that the, the first time I went to Pompeii, um, we had no, they had no kit. So we asked all the 92 league clubs at the time uh, if they could donate shirts. And basically, everyone said no, except for Yeovil Town. And um, so batch of shirts we bought out were Yeovil Town shirts and gave them out <laughs> to the players and the way that society is in my community it's very much like again you defer to your elders so the shirts would be worn by the players but then gradually slowly, slowly but surely um, their parents would often say shirt I want it and so the shirt would just belong to like an older cousin or a brother or a so you just go out into remote Micronesia <laughs> and you'd be walking around and you'd see a Yeovil Town shirt <laughs> And the same sort of thing happened with shin pads. We don't know why we thought we needed shin pads, but we believe you needed shin pads for a long while. Players totally refused to wear them. It's absolutely never going to happen. They wouldn't <laughs> wear football shorts either. Shorts are like, they only wear long, long shorts. So the football shorts we gave them were just like, it was <laughs> indecent to them that they would wear them. Shin pads were even more ridiculous, the idea that they'd block the weather shin pads. So they all just disappeared one day. And it, we found them being used for a variety of different things, just like to prop stuff up, there's, you know, just on people's <laughs> coffee tables, the decorations. Uh, but some, sometimes you see someone in the jungle with a machete and they'd have shin pads on. <laughs> 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 you sort of realise exactly how misguided our first efforts were. <laughs> At least you tried. Health and safety. Yeah. Yes. Exactly right. But I'm thinking now, you know, maybe it'll be, yeah, those Povey shirts and people will go out and say, what, what is Povey? Like, what is, is it a religion? <laughs> is it like, is it one of the, one of the missionary chapters that came here? And <laughs> I, I'm sure I can source some. So I'm sure I can source some. <laughs> <That was> brilliant. <laughs> Um, Paul, it's been really, absolutely, really brilliant to to talk to you about this. And Lish, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, Paul, I just really quickly as well um, wanted to ask you about Kitmas because mm. I would love to do Kitmas, but I've just never been organised enough to sort it out. Can you just tell us very quickly about Kitmas and what you do? Yes, so um, it was basically an idea that came about because I had a lot of football kit in my garage, and I usually sending it out all over the world um, to different causes and places, uh, mostly in Africa, and got towards Christmas in 2020 and I had some shirts and didn't have anything to, to do with them. Um, partly because they were, they were brand new. Um, I think they were Chelsea or Man United shirt. They're a really nice kit. Um, but I couldn't give them where I, where the person who donated them said, can you give them to a refugee group that I work with? I, I couldn't because it would mark these 10 kids out as, you know, you get these shirts, you don't. So I, I had nothing to do with them and was getting towards Christmas and sort of thought, well, actually, you know, a lot of kids in this country are, their parents are probably going to struggle to put sort of presents for them. And, you know, it's a very tough time, especially in 2020, you know, start of COVID pandemic, a lot of families was, were struggling. So just brought them down to my local sort of food bank here in Strat. So, you know, would these be of any use? Um, and they, they were delighted and said, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing we need. And so after that, sent out a message on Twitter saying, you know, it's just something that, might be able to do with a few more shirts you know if, if people and it just absolutely snowballed and we we ended up getting a thousand shirts and sent them to community centers all over the uk um 16 different community centers um and then did the same year after it got a lot bigger again and then we just did it in in 2022 and it was i think now we've done about five thousand shirts in total around um, the uk and it's just something we like to do either people can donate you know as new really good quality shirts that they already have that maybe they're not going to use um or they can donate money and we buy shirts for 
kids and then donate them to the centres. So as I say, we just give them to the community centres. They're doing this year this work like year round. So we're really just mm-hmm. a drop in the ocean. And it's really quite humbling as well because we send, you know, we send around the country. We send to and we send to places like Newcastle and we sent them something like a uh, hundred shirts and said, you know, do you have enough enough demand for these? And they're saying, you know, thank you, but you know, we do have three thousand children that we're looking after this year, and that's just Newcastle. And that, you know, just scale of the problem. Every year we just kind of want to do a bit more, but um, it's been a really nice process and the way people kind of get behind it is really lovely. Perhaps we can, um, perhaps sort of later in the year, once you once the futsal tournament's out of the way, we can perhaps have a chat again and see see how how maybe we can um, we can maybe help and get involved in that. That would be really nice. Um, be Paul nice. Watson, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, it's been really illuminating talking about football in Micronesia. Um, it's absolutely nothing to do with Berkshire. I just thought it was really interesting. So <laughs> why the hell not? Um, it, well, it's our platform, isn't it, Lish? So we we can do what we like with it. So um, that, that's what we decided to do. Um, and Alicia Povey, thank you so much for joining us thanks guys thank you both it's been lovely thanks for your time it's a real pleasure to chat thank you